I'm the publisher of the Stanford Social Innovation Review. It is a publication of the Stanford Graduate School of Business focused on nonprofits, philanthropy, and corporate social responsibility. Um, to my right, I have Will Rosenswig. Will, you have a very long bio. So Don't read it. Condense it a little bit. So many Actually, distinct, skip it. so many then distinguished. People. Accomplishments. No, no. no. Um, Will is the co founder and managing director of Great Spirit Ventures, which is a early stage capital firm, uh, venture capital firm that invests in the intersection of food, agriculture, and medicine. Will is an entrepreneur, investor, and brand builder. Um, he was the co founder and CEO of the Republic of Tea, a senior vice president of Odwala, vice president of Nakamichi and partner and CEO of Hembrick Vineyards and Wineries. Um, he was also the chairman of winetasting.com, and he recently co-founded Kingdom of Herbs, um, a fantastic store in the Ferry Building in San Francisco. You're making me feel really ah. old right now. Um, Will is a very busy man. He's also on the faculty um, at the Center for Responsible Business at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. Um, he's also been advisor and consultant to the Rockefeller Foundation's Provenex Fund, and he's been the co-author of the Republic of Tea, How an Idea Became a Business. Um, enough? Okay. To his right is Priya Singh. Uh, Priya, during her senior year at Stanford, co-founded Free at Last, a broad-based substance abuse and social services organization in East Palo Alto. As the ED, she grew the program to become a national model, serving over 3,000 people per year, an annual budget of $2.5 million, and a staff of 60. Ms. Haji was recognized in 1998 as one of America's 10 most outstanding young leaders by the Do Something Foundation, MTV, and Mademoiselle Magazine. She did her MBA at the Haas School of Business, and she is now the CEO and co-founder of World of Good, a fair trades gifts company in Berkeley. Um, Adam Lowry isn't here yet, but I'll take the... Uh I'll introduce him right now so that when he comes in, you know who he is. Um, Adam is the founder and VP of product development for Method Products. Uh, Method has grown quickly uh, as a uh, house cleaning uh, company by infusing emotion into commodity cleaning products using great design and environmental responsibility. Um, previous to that, Adam was at the Carnegie Institute at Washington where he developed software products for the study of global climate change. Adam began his career in product design, developing plastic parts for the automotive industry, where he earned the first of his five patents. So that's a broad introduction of our panelists. Maybe what we'll do for um, today's format is I'm going to turn it over to the panelists, who will tell you a little bit about their experiences and their, the lessons that they've learned. Then we're going to do a guided discussion with the panelists, um, and then we're going to open it up for a Q&A for 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the session. So please keep your questions in mind as we go through. So let's turn it over to you, Will. OK. Um, let's see. Well, I, I, uh, I'm speechless. Um, I'm just looking at the title again. Well, uh, I, I think what I'd like to do actually is um, right now I'm in a I'm in a role where I'm serving as an entrepreneur and an investor, and I've kind of passed uh, I think in a stage in my life where I'm working really to uh, help to empower uh, and provide the resources and environment for other uh, entrepreneurs to succeed. And that's what I've been concentrating a lot of my energy on, is sort of what are the conditions that are necessary for a venture to be successful. And I think it would be, it might be interesting um, and for, for you to hear a little bit more about what Priya is doing, because she's in the throes right now of actually getting a venture off the ground. And I might be able to add some color commentary to what she's doing, because we're actually working together on a venture. And um, I might be able to provide some context and expertise, but I think you'd find it very interesting to kind of hear um, what it's like for a business school student to kind of be jettisoned out of uh, university into the real world of venture-backed uh, entrepreneurship. So could I delegate it over to you? <laughs> How, was that smooth or what? That was very smooth. Really, okay. Well, 
Well, I'll start. And you'll jump you're, in. You're good at scoring. Okay. So, so um, well, I guess, first of all, I think the title of the panel is a lot to live up to. So I think I'd like to just say striving to be successful entrepreneurs. I think that's really important because <laughs> I don't think, maybe you never feel that you've arrived or that you are successful, but I certainly have not yet and haven't gotten to where we have envisioned this company being. Um, World of Good, for, those, um, for everyone to just know what we're about, is that we really launched as a socially responsible gift, accessories, and housewares product line, um, which is going into stores like Whole Foods. We also work with bookstores, gift stores, um, and we do a full store within a store footprint uh, where we kind of give them a whole concept around these kinds of products. Everything has a story tag, tells you where it comes from, and they're really beautiful handmade things. The other part of our company is that we source everything um, from small artisan cooperatives under fair trade guidelines from about 30, 30 different countries and over 100 different artisan cooperatives. And from the very beginning when we started the company, the mission is that by building a great company and a great business and a great line, we will actually, in the process, bring along many, many, many thousands of artisans, mostly women, around the world as we move this product. And um, the other part of our company is that from the very beginning, we envisioned it with a twofold purpose. One is to really enter the market with an ethically sourced product line around the principles of fair trade, and in doing so, create a shift in the market overall and to encourage other companies to also practice in ethically sourced ways, which is what we saw happen in the organics movement, where the first organics companies entered, and by doing so, they changed the dynamics of the entire marketplace. And now you have organic milk at Walmart. And um, that is something that was really inconceivable 20 years ago. And we think that with supply chain accountability or fair trade or ethical sourcing, the same thing is possible in a consumer-based society in such a way that it can really change and be the next consumer movement the way that organics was now. We believe that fair trade or ethical sourcing can be. And so with that in mind, we also founded the company with a nonprofit arm. Uh, there's two separate companies, and the nonprofit is called World of Good Development Organization. And what we're working on there are standards around ethical pricing models and around fair trade principles for handmade goods. And um, we have a whole pricing calculator technology and a lot of other things we're working on. And then we also take 10% of the profits and put it back for economic development projects in the communities where the products are sourced from. And right now the company is in a rapid <coughs> stage of growth. I um, worked on the idea when I was in business school um, at Haas with a lot of my classmates actually. So the one thing I can tell all of you if you're, I mean I think you're all like I was in school, is um, the best thing you never know is who's around you and what they know and what they're capable of becoming in your vision or who you are capable of being in their vision. And I think that's a really important thing to always bear in mind. And my classmates who became part of this company with me, one of them is Siddharth who runs our marketing team. And he had a totally other background, building websites and doing all kinds of internet marketing and um, had worked in sort of Fortune 100 companies. And you know, I convinced him to work on it in a class project. And then a couple of my other classmates were advisors, and we all kind of worked on it together. After school, I left and went traveling for like a year and met with different artists and cooperatives to look at what were the issues, try to analyze what was going on, came back to actually launch the company um, in the US. And then Siddharth was working consulting. And I went to him, and I'm like, Siddharth, I think I'm really going to do this. And he was like, OK, fine. I'll quit my job, and I'll come and help you. I'm like, great. you know. And I think that is a big part of being an entrepreneur, is like um, being able, in those early stages, when you don't really have anything else but a vision, to paint that picture and to convince so many other smart people, which I've been very fortunate, to come along and to take a risk and to try to help you and um, to work on something. And so Siddharth worked on the branding, the concept, and all of that. Um, and then we um, launched the company, and we did a test first. And we went out, and um, we sourced all the product from an initial set of producer groups. And we put together an idea of how the store within a store would work and how the whole model would work. And in my opinion, you don't have a company till you have a customer. And, um, and we went out, and you know, we went and presented to five stores, and all five um, wanted it. And actually, two out of the five on the first time were like, can you leave it here today? And, you know, the truth was I couldn't because if I did, we didn't have any more product. <laughs> but I was like, well, you know, actually, 
there's a two week delivery cycle <laughs> and you know I needed time and and as an entrepreneur that's a lot of the position I think you're in too is you're building a vision of something that's much bigger than what you have now with the resources you have now um, and building your way to it sort of behind the scenes and catching up to what's possible um, anyway so we did this 50 store test in the Bay Area and then we also tested the product in Texas we had incredible results in the stores sales per square foot Whole Foods joined us right from the beginning and brought us in and that was great and um, and with that we really went into business plan competitions which we did last year or this year I don't even it's like all one big blur um, I think in the beginning of this year so we won GSVC this year last year this year, <laughs> sorry, this I think it was this year. So we won GSBC. We also um, had the good fortune to place in the Berkeley Business Plan Competition. Through that, we then had the opportunity to compete in the Draper Fisher, Jurvetson kind of like venture challenge that they had, and we won that, which I think <coughs> was great, and all of that was really helpful. And then that we were already in the process of putting together a round to um, strengthen the company and to grow the idea to scale and to launch it across the United States. And um, we were very fortunate to raise a round um, and had, I think, a bit of an atypical experience, but also a very good one and a very wide range of investors, everyone from people who really got the social mission and cared first about the social mission to people who really saw the business and saw the potential of the business. And in the end, what I believe is that people should invest in the strength of the company and the business itself. And I think that's the strongest way to raise, um, to raise investment. And it's the right way because that's the real proposition. Um, it, anyway. It's, it's the right way, but it's not the way it really happens because uh, investors always at an early stage invest in a person or a team um, so they have to find the value proposition very compelling but they have to find the entrepreneurs intensely dedicated and committed and um, really living the vision so I think that one of the things that was interesting about Priya's experience in World of Good was that the um, the business plan competitions actually provided a really nice platform <laughs> Uh, to showcase the, um, the the power of of what World of Good was about, and I think the fact that I think what startled everyone and was very compelling was that this was a company that was introduced into a social venture business plan competition and then placed second in this you know high tech <laughs> business plan competition with you know judges from major venture capital firms. So all of a sudden, this was, in my experience, I've been teaching social entrepreneurship for about six years now at Berkeley. Um, this is the first time that a social venture sort of crossed over as a legitimate venture, which means sort of no excuses, right? High potential, big expectations. And um, so I think it was very, very, very interesting. I just I, I like to point this out as a case study because I think we're moving now from the hypothetical or the theoretical into practice. World of Good, to my experience, um, is the first venture that's actually been financed at a venture capital level of expectation by this um, sector, cross sector um, of investors. A foundation, a mainstream venture capital firm, a friends and family group, and a lead investor who's actually a very sophisticated general partner in a in a large venture capital firm in Silicon Valley who invested personally through his family's foundation. It's very interesting. Okay, so you have a sophisticated investor who says this doesn't really fit the dimensions of my venture capital firm. Okay. But I'm very sophisticated about how I look at investments and I want to use that rationale and apply it to my personal wealth that I've accumulated and put it into this company. So that's the good news. Then the bad news is <laughs> the expectations, right? Well, I don't think it's bad news. Okay, I'm kidding you. But it's, kidding. <laughs> it's like a lot. It is a responsibility that comes with it. Does it that. keep you up at night or? No, but it wakes me up in the morning. <laughs> um, I think um, the other part I would say is um, after we raised a round of financing and then you know focusing on expanding the strategy of the company, 
you know, the next thing that happens, and I mean, those of you that have been part of a startup before know this, and I think it's really important to focus on this, is that the first thing that happens when you raise money is everyone congratulates you. I mean, everyone congratulates you for raising money. And it's so seductive because, I mean, in the end, it's not really what matters. You know, what you did is put gas in the tank, but you didn't go anywhere and you didn't accomplish anything by raising money. And while we're very honored that we have all these people that have joined us and they've taken a role in working with us on the company, okay, and, you know, that's not it. And then, you know, the next stage of it all was that we had to grow the team and, you know, we've now launched in five regions all across the western United States and we have teams in all those regions. We're now in over... Uh, about 250 stores by Christmas with a footprint, and our sales per square foot are continuing to be about about four times industry average to six times, depending on the type of store. So we're very happy about that. Um, and obviously, we have a lot of eggs in the basket because this is Christmas, and you know, for us, this is we're having like the ramp of all the stores plus seasonality. So we have like a huge pop happening in this last part of the year, and there's a lot riding on that and a lot that we have to prove that consumers will actually consciously choose to pick World of Good products in the places that they are to take home as holiday presents and that the stories and the products themselves really make great gifts and that's an important thing that we have to prove over this next period you know and so I guess the interesting thing is is you know when you raise expenses is sort of the next thing that happens after you raise financing right so you hire your team you get your office you buy your inventory and again all the people around you they congratulate you you know because like that appears as success because you're like you know now you have a bigger office or you have whatever I mean we started in the business school incubator at Berkeley like in the basement of the Bancroft Hotel so we were there for like a year servicing our first 50 stores out of there and we had rented like what used to be kind of like a refrigeration space I think or something so there was just like boxes everywhere and products everywhere and that's how we did our first test and now we're in a not in a big fancy warehouse we're in a nice little building and then we got so much product that we had to rent the space next door so, you know, and I think it's important that, yes, we're expanding, but again, it's a little bit seductive when you grow your team and you add expenses. Like, that's not what a company is to be congratulated for. What we have to accomplish is the ability to show that the product is really going to move and that people are going to get it. That because it's ethically sourced and it's fair trade, yeah, that's good. But in the end, do people really like the products that we have? And are we picking right? And are we choosing right? Are we helping the producer groups to design the products that will sell? Like, is someone going to take this shawl home and give it to their mom for Christmas? And when that happens, that is really when we've started to create the kind of market bridge that can really lead to sustained economic opportunity for the artisan groups. If we can't convert it to revenues, then we haven't done anything for anyone yet. And so I think that's where, you know, for me, I have a lot of humility because we're at a great stage and we've come a long way and we are having good sell through, but there's a, a lot that remains to be seen. And next year for us is going to be even bigger than this year. I mean, we're talking with two other big national partners. We're looking at expanding into four other regions and, you know, it's got to keep working incrementally and people have to respond to what we're doing for it to work. So that's where the humility is because that's something we don't know and we don't control but we can just try to influence and get it right. So, so well, you know, Priya, thank you for this very vivid and honest tale of what it's like starting up a comp company. Now, Will, you've started Honest uh, Republic of Tea. How does that compare with sort of what Priya is going through? Well, I think uh, starting any company is sort of a journey. Yeah. Uh, you have an idea of where you want to go, and uh, it's kind of an iterative process. I don't think uh, if... if it doesn't reveal itself right away. So I think there's a certain amount of uh, curiosity and courage and uh, ultimately you have to get to a point of confidence and commitment. Mm -hmm. um, founding the Republic of Tea was very serendipitous. I had been, uh, a, lot of, a lot of entrepreneurial ventures start with the seed of discontent. Uh, we're always trying to solve some problem for ourselves. Mine was the frustration of not being able to get a decent cup of tea. And uh, this all became sort of very vivid on, on an airplane ride where I met somebody who shared the same problem. And we were sitting next to each other and had a six-hour conversation together. And by the time we'd landed, we decided to start a new company. Wow. <laughs> 
Um, and the seed of that, just so you know, that was at a um, something called the Social Venture Network Conference. This was in 1990. Social Venture Network was the group that gave birth to what is now Net Impact. So it was a group of people that shared sort of similar views of the world, common values. Um, I actually it took me two years to start this company, uh, Republic of Tea, um, and I had to take another job in between, um, you know, sort of getting the idea and playing with the idea. Uh, so I had to do a lot of traveling around, a lot of introspection, and a lot of investigation. It was interesting. I came up with a lot of ideas, and um, if you've ever read this book, that's, there's a book out called The Republic of Tea. It's, it's the, these letters that I actually exchanged with my co-founder, Mel Ziegler. And um, what's interesting is we had all these great ideas for the, for the product and the company. And um, you know, one day I woke up, it was, it was funny, we were just brainstorming all these ideas, it was very seductive, let's start a new company. And I woke up one day and I realized, you know what, I don't really know enough about tea. <laughs> I don't really know anything about tea. How can I start a great tea company? I mean, it, it sounds stupid now, but, but, but the moral of the story really is, I mean, no matter what your values are or where you want to innovate, you have to have a great product. People are not going to buy a product just because it's fair trade. I mean, inherently, world of goods products are beautiful, wonderful products. The fact that they're sourced in a fair trade manner adds value to them, but they have a lot of intrinsic value um, that gets people to buy them. So I guess one of the things I've learned over all the ventures that I've done, I mean, at Odwalla, we learned this over and over, any venture we're starting, you have to have an incredibly compelling product or service or, you know, reason for being. The fact that it might be, you know, wrapped in, for lack of a better word, enlightened values or values that are trying to generate another bottom line, we're not quite to a point in the world where people fully appreciate that context. In the, in the organic food world, we have a sense that people will pay, you know, 10 to 15 percent, sort of there's a price elasticity of 10 to 15 percent, but that's about it. You know, at the end of the day, if you don't have a product that people will buy again, no matter what your value proposition is, it, it doesn't really matter. And how did um, Republic of Tea scale up? And we heard a little bit about Priya and moving from the basement of the Bankrupt Hotel to the warehouse and going door to door. Well, I had a very, I had a, not a dissimilar situation. I remember very vividly um, my first, you know, way I got started was I, uh, when I realized that I didn't know anything about tea, I went to England. And I was supposed to meet a man who I'd been introduced to who had a um, tea, owned some tea plantations and was based in London. And I got to London, you know, and I got off the plane and I called and I found out from this gentleman's wife that he had just had a stroke and was now in the hospital and was now unable to meet with me. So imagine flying all the way to Europe and getting there. Um, I went to uh, the, there's a place in London that is sort of the headquarters of all tea trading and I just kind of walked in and I said, hi, I'm from America and I want to turn the people in America on to good tea. You know, who should I talk to? <laughs> <laughs> and they rolled their eyes and as it turned out, very serendipitously again, I met a man who had been a tea broker and a tea expert for 35 years and he had three sons and they were all about my age at the time, I was about 29 years old. And none of the sons wanted to go into the tea business. And all of a sudden I showed up <laughs> and he sort of adopted me. I was so eager and so curious and so enthusiastic and I spent about six weeks with this guy and he taught me, I was his apprentice, he taught me about tea. And so what happened, this was the beginning of the first sort of competitive advantage. Because what I was able to do now was I was able to trade on his 35 years of sourcing experience, which he brought directly into the Republic of Tea. And so I went back to the United States and decided, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to start the business. And I had gone back and I mentioned this to my former um, collaborator who had 
written all these letters with me. He had sort of dropped out of the conversation after about six weeks. What I didn't tell you before was that while we were engaged for this first six weeks, um, we generated about 450 pages of ideas. I always encourage my students to write down their ideas because when you're in this, you know, sort of evolutionary process of your idea, if you don't write it down, it just keeps changing and morphing and you got to track it. You got to have something tangible that you can really challenge. So I was very rigorous and about writing down all these ideas. And somebody had been, somebody who, um, it was a mutual friend of ours, uh, one night looked at these papers. They were actually faxes, okay, just to date myself. This is pre-email. So these are faxes that were sent back. We, we generated over 400 and something pages of faxes in six weeks. And this friend of, of ours was looking at these faxes and said, gee, these faxes, th this, should be, this should be made into a book about how to start a business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Wow, that's great. Imagine this is six weeks after the airplane flight, okay? I'm like, wow, you know, okay. He said, can I send these to um, a friend of mine at Doubleday? So he said, okay, sure. So we send, send the faxes to this woman at Doubleday. She writes back, says, I want to publish these faxes as a book. So all of a sudden, we've got a book offer to, you know, publish a book about how to start a business. This is to Priya's point about successful. So my head is spinning and my partner says to me, you know, gee, I don't think it's appropriate to publish a book about how to start a business unless we have a business. <laughs> <laughs> it's like small detail, right? So, anyway, make a long story short, 18 months later, I come back from London, okay, after meandering my way around. This, I never let go of this idea. I had to do other work in the meantime. Came back from London with this new relationship had some tea with me. I went to Costco in South San Francisco with this tea to see if I could actually get a sophisticated little Chinese lady mm -hmm. to like my tea. Because I thought, here's some people that really know tea, and if they <laughs> like my tea, this is my market research, okay? I had a, and I got into Costco because my friend Elliot Hoffman, who owned Just Desserts, was selling cookies. Mm -hmm. So I said, can I go with you? Anyway, we, uh, we had a successful test market. And then, you know, to your point about how do you scale up? So then I thought, okay, I need an office. So I remember this very vividly because I started looking for space in San Rafael where there were some industrial parks. And I'd go, you know, door to door. I'd go to the leasing agent. They'd say, show us three years of financials and the personal guarantee. I'd say, well, you know, we haven't exactly started the business yet. And I, I literally went through this. I remember going home one night and thinking, I'm never going to get an office. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever going to, you know, give me space. And then I finally, by the end of the day, I'd gotten to this one office, sort of office park. And this very nice lady, I said, you know, I'm looking for some space. And she said, what do you, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to start a great tea company. And she was, she happened to be Persian. And she said, come into my office and sit down, you know? And she, she listened to me and she took this one page lease out of her drawer. And by the way, the other people, they had like 50 page or 100 page leases. Okay, they dropped this big corporate document on. She had this one page lease from like Office Depot. <laughs> she said, sign here. I'm just telling you these things because what happens is these were, the, these were my investors right off the bat. Okay. These were people that believed in me somehow. And they sort of saw into me that I believed in what I was doing. And they, they offered help. So I just want to sort of point out that it's sort of amazing how much help you can get when you're committed. People want to be part of things, even if you don't have a track record. Mm -hmm. Just believing in what you're doing and being smart enough to know sort of where you're going probably more important to know who you are than exactly where you're going. And I think the people, the investors perceive this. So then what happened was Doubleday wrote back and said, we're going to publish the book now. And they cut a seven, uh, they cut a six figure advance on the book. 
which we use to fund the business. <laughs> so this might be the first business ever funded with a book advance. <laughs> That's a lot of serendipitous relationships that you were able to forge. I, I um, Newark Airport. Just remember that. Newark <laughs> Airport. Very, That's very good networking. place. I met my business partner there. I met my wife there. It's very good karma there. Very, very lucky place. Doesn't that, you wouldn't think so? Highly recommend it. Thanks for that advice. Yeah. Is that Adam? Yes, it is. Oh, Sorry, yeah. everyone. A little mix up this, this afternoon. So. Perfect timing. Um, <laughs> we've already just done introductions, and so I was just asking the panelists to tell us a little bit about how they got started in their business. So Great. Well, thanks for going first, guys. And again, I, I apologize. Um, so my business is Method Home Care. It's a, um, a cleaning products brand that uh, some of you may have seen at uh, Target, premium grocery stores around. Um, you can get it at Safeway now. Um, our core insight, uh, we started the business uh, in early 2000 on the core insight that the emotion that people feel for their homes, the way they kind of live their lives in their homes is uh, that is disconnected from the products that you use to maintain your home. So you have this wonderful experience. You, know, um, uh, you have these wonderful experiences in the way that you uh, kind of care for your home, the way you live there, but the products you use to maintain it are kind of ugly and boring and you kind of hide them under the sink. They're very toxic. Um, furthermore, the, the way we have, the way we maintain our homes and the way we clean has changed from bucket and rubber gloves, um, get out the, you know, the bucket and the rubber gloves and, and clean all day Saturday to kind of on the go uh, cleaning. People are living more active lives. And so what we really set out to do using design, um, building in social and environmental responsibility uh, was to really pioneer the, the premium home care category and really invent the first premium brand in home care. Maybe you can share with us uh, the story of how you you found your partner. Uh, yeah, my uh, my co-founder is a guy named Eric Ryan. We went to the same high school back in uh, Michigan. Uh, we both grew up in Detroit and knew each other since we were little kids. As the story goes, we, uh, we kind of lost touch, um, and it turned out that he was living three doors down from me in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as time went by, he moved in. I was living... Um, I was living in a flat in San Francisco with, with four fraternity brothers from Stanford, and uh, he moved in with us, started uh, kind of sharing some of our ideas about, uh, we both were really big fans of design, uh, so we started talking uh, about some of those common interests and some categories that had yet to be reinvented through the use of uh, design. And uh, we kind of landed on home cleaning as one of the biggest, baddest categories where it was just obvious that design could really play a role as well as environmental responsibility. Um, and Eric's background is one, uh, he comes from an advertising world, so he's great at crafting brands um, and creating communication about brands. And my background is um, a chemical engineer, environmental scientist uh, by education and a product designer by uh, trade. So I uh, realized we really had a um, complementary skill set to create a, a brand promise and a product experience that delivered on that brand promise. Uh, and that really formed the nucleus of the company. Um, from there, we, uh, we were young when we started the company. Um, we were relatively inexperienced. We, we knew the things we were good at, but we knew we weren't really, um, neither of us had raised capital before. Um, neither of us had, had started a business before. So um, we went out and tried to just find the best of the best of people that um, could really help us bring our business to the next level, start down the funding uh, trail, and, and so forth. So, And how, um, what kind of investors were you able to find? Yeah, the um, we initially capitalized the business by reaching into our wallets as, as deeply as we could, which didn't get us very far, um, mm -hmm. and raised uh, about $300,000 through friends and family. So this is grandma, brother, sister, mom, dad. Uh, mom and dad's friends, everybody we could get. And there was a very long list of people that, that ended up um, giving us that initial uh, about 300000 um, We raised that money through convertible debt, which was something that worked very well for us. Um, for, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, 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 it's a debt instrument that converts into equity at a later time that uh, we specified as our Series A financing. 
um, which we set as a million dollars or more. And so we operated the business for about a year on that money. Nobody was getting paid, um, including our vendors. <laughs> and uh, we <laughs> – and uh, it was uh, – I, I tell the story to people like, um, for those of you who have seen the Back to the Future movie when Michael J. Fox is playing the guitar and he's falling down and his, his parents kiss out on the dance floor and he springs back up and he plays Johnny Be Good. And that was kind of our business when we raised Series A financing because we were out of cash. We were on um, credit hole with all of our vendors. Um, and eventually uh, we were able to uh, close financing uh, initially with a, an affiliate of the Simon Property Group, which is um, the largest REIT in the United States. So they own the Mall of America, the Forum Shops in Vegas, the Georgia Mall, or, uh, <coughs> The Georgia Mall, um, and some of their tenants are some of our customers. So it was a, a good strategic fit, um, and they were doing some investments in high-risk companies at the uh, beginning stages. So that was who we got our original funding from. From there, we've raised uh, two or three more rounds uh, of equity, and um, you know it, it gets a lot easier after the first one. A lot easier. This is what I love about social entrepreneurs. They all have such colorful stories of how they started and got funded. Um, before we turn into the discussion, maybe I'll just um, ask a general question that I'd love to get your comments on is, um, you know, certainly in the work that we do at the Stanford Social Innovation Review, um, we write a lot about corporate social responsibility. We write about social ventures. We write about nonprofits that have for-profit social arms. Tell us a little bit about how you think about how your company fulfills that social mission, and where are you on the spectrum, and you know what is the difference in your mind of a socially responsible company versus a social venture? Do you want to start, Priya? Oh, um, sure. I guess. Well, I would. I think uh, put mapping sort of that spectrum. Uh, I would definitely put World of Good as being sort of both. A, it's very much a social venture. I mean, everything about what we're doing and every product we sell carries our mission within it. And um, and there's a lot of sort of different parameters that come into our business model as a result of the mission that we've undertaken. So, for example, I'll just use this little bag as an example. This is made by a producer group in Zimbabwe from all post-consumer waste uh, recycled bottle caps, and those of you that know what's happening right now in Zimbabwe, it's in, it's in a very difficult time in the history of the country. And um, we work with a series of producer groups. So when this bag was a super hit for us during the summer, um, it wasn't that we can just call and go, hey, send us 10,000 more, you know, or, you know, fire up the factory. I mean, that's not the situation that we're in. We're in a situation where, okay, we know the product's a hit. We know it will work. We know we can do other varieties out of that product. But each one is made by hand. Um, we pay the capital in advance. We work with very small producers. Meanwhile, the government is, like, tearing down their workshops, and the con currency is inflating day by day, and so people can't even live, much less, you know, maybe think about making something that they could sell. So when we're working in that kind of an environment, the limitations on product um, become very real. And so as a company, that creates a kind of stress, potentially. And, you know, and our investors asked us a lot about that, like, you know, what are, how are you going to mitigate that, essentially, and what are you doing as a business strategy? So for our case, our company, is that we do products from so many producer groups, and, for example, we're launching a housewares line. There was the flood in Guatemala. All the placemats that we were doing from Guatemala were trapped under basically a landslide, and the producer group, we wanted to still pay them. We were able to launch the line with the placemats from another country, and when those get here, we'll integrate them in. So we don't let go of the group and we don't let go of our commitments, but it results in different. So we manage our products like a portfolio, basically. So when we sell to the stores, we don't sell individual products. We sell them a program. And we actually have the right to switch in one placemat for another without actually asking them, which is a very unusual commitment that we've gotten from the retailers, but it's because they understand our mission. And as long as all the products are selling, they're actually very interested in supporting that mission so far. So that's an example of where we developed a business strategy to cope with a real limitation to our supply side. And, and then in the same way, the way we give our money back, and then the nonprofit that we founded to work on standards. So kind of our mission is very deeply embedded into the structure of our company and the way we financed it, 
the for-profit is funded as a for-profit and the non-profit actually has grants to work on the calculator. We have foundations and individual donors that have contributed to that. So it's really a, a two-fold company. And our, our VC funders on the for-profit side, they really get what we're doing and they get the limits, but they see the business that's in there and the business <coughs> strategies we use to mitigate those stresses. And why did you choose to have that? It's structured as a for-profit, the for-profit that you do have. Why? Because I believe that we're building a great business that will return a great return. Mm -hmm. I think it's there. I think it's through business that the producers will do well, and it is through business that the brand will grow, that we'll get the distribution we need, that will drive the scale we need, and the kind of capital that's required to draw the scale we want to draw. 5,000 points of distribution in the United States would allow us to help 1,000 artists and communities around the world. So for us to get to 5,000 points of distribution across the United States, the scale requires a capital infusion that will require a return. And we are fine with that. We think that's good. Just like for the artisans, they are each building their own businesses as well. And we think that's great. And on the nonprofit side, we do other activities that will never generate a return. Um, the calculator, we don't want it owned by any one company. We want it to be an international standard and a free tool. It's a free software, essentially. So that is not something that should be owned by World of Good or any other company. So for that, we set it up as a nonprofit. It has charitable resources that keep it dedicated to the public good. And we drew in the resources that are appropriate for that to grow. And so we thought about, basically, in our overall mission, what is a business and what is a social mission incorporate those separately and manifest them each with their own capital um, sources and their own mission and, and run them side by side. And that's that's the way it's working now and it's working well. I mean, it's it's working well. That makes a lot of sense because the more successful you are as a business, the bigger social impact you're able to have. Right, and ironically, I really believe, well, I believe in the long run, World of Good will become a very successful company, will launch a very successful brand and help thousands of people that way, but I actually believe the bigger impact that we will have as a company will be through the nonprofit because what's going to happen is that pricing calculator and the standards that we generate around ethical pricing of products will not only be for World of Good, but will become for Pier 1, Cost Plus, Crate and Barrel, a new standard. And World of Good will be the competitive entrant that generates that shift in the entire market around pricing for handcrafted goods. And so the legacy of our company, I believe, will be in the for-profit, but will be even bigger in the nonprofit. And there should be other resources to manage that so that it's not just, because if the investors were paying for that, they wouldn't be happy, because right. that's not generating a return. Right. right. And if the donors were paying for a business that could generate a return, in my opinion, that's not a good use of donor resources. because. There are schools and there are AIDS clinics, and I used to run a drug treatment program. I mean, there are tons of things in the world that will never get done through profit, and those things deserve to be funded charitably, and we should not divert charitable dollars for things that can be a business. Right. And so that's why we bifurcated our strategy that way. Fascinating. Adam, yeah. how, do you, how do you guys see yourself on the spectrum? Um, so going back to the question, you were talking social venture to... Corporate social responsibility. Yeah. Um, again, I think um, for us, they're really just integrated in, in, we really don't see a lot of difference between those things, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. Um, and for us, while we have not bifurcated our, our business, um, we, uh, the way that World of Good has, we um, really all, the, the kind of governing strategy for us is our brand. So our brand is something that lives and breathes in the hearts and minds of our consumers. Um, and the social and environmental responsibility is is baked into that so that everything that we do from our products to the type of energy we use to run our offices to er the choices we make on all fronts of our business are things that reflect that aspect of our brand. Um, our brand has many dimensions as well. Fragrance is important. The design is important as well. Um, but uh, ultimately what you know, our long-term goal is, is we want to um, establish the first fully sustainable business in all of its dimensions within our category. Mm -hmm. um, and that means, re you know, using renewable energy. It means um, different types of business models. It means eliminating waste of all kind. It means benign emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually have laid out, we have a plan of about six different fronts on which we're attacking this. Um, but ultimately, each one of those things is building in... Um, the, the social and environmental responsibility into the experience that our consumers have 
um, with our products and with our brand, and that is ultimately how we are judged. Um, We have a very different business in that um, we, I I think your strategy is is right on and and super smart. We, our strategy being um, selling to retailers such as Target and mainstream grocery, uh, we've tried similar things and been unsuccessful with being able to kind of, pull, you know, put things in and pull them out. Um, so we're very much um, we're very much uh, nailed to the supply chain infrastructure that we have. And so what we need to do is go to some of these uh, supply chain providers, and then we try to through our vendor qualification uh, process make sure that they're either ISO 14001 qualified or they meet the set of environmental and social, uh, the labor standards that we have set uh, as conditions for working with our business. And so we kind of we kind of have to do it that way because we're a little bit more constricted on the, um, right. on the sell side, sell side. Our business. Will, do you have any thoughts, any trends that you've seen? Well, I think, I, I think World of Good, just from my experience, represents a, a, a very interesting new model. The, the words, you know, social venture are getting bandied a, a, mm-hmm. about a lot. And uh, in, it, in school and in, in, at, at Haas, we like to think about a social venture as a business that actually makes a, a commitment to uh, a second bottom line or a third, if you will, and not only commits to integrating uh, the generation of value to that second bottom line, but also uh, offers to measure it. And uh, because there's a lot of businesses, I think, that are embracing uh, practices of sustainability, and I think there are companies that are, um, you know, promoting their commitment through their brand, as Adam's talking about, and then that can add value, perceived value to a, to a customer. But um, it still remains kind of a conventional business going after an emerging market where customers might have a broader sense of, of values. So it's a little bit different, I think, where some businesses that are quote unquote socially responsible are looking to kind of mitigate um, damage, you know, do no harm. Um, certain businesses that are actually, um, which I would characterize as social ventures, are working to positively generate um, social, positive social impact and have some idea of the decisions that they can make in the business, how those impact the generation and amount of social return. Um, you know, in my experience, companies like Odwalla or Republic of Tea, these were these were companies that were attempting to be socially responsible. They were they were redefining how they measured success, but at the end of the day, they were fundamentally a business, and the business is measured on its um, you know fin- mm-hmm. financial vitality. And um, when I was at Odwalla, we had a very interesting experience because the company was founded. Many of you probably heard Greg Steltonpole yesterday. He he shared with you that you know he was a he was a musician and he was looking for fresh juice and. You know, he and his buddies were trying to get, um, really pay for their nighttime jazz gigs, and they went around providing fresh juice to people. And they were really more interested in um, a kind of a lifestyle and a really high quality product. And they were really interested at that time of just making enough for them to scrape by. They didn't really have a concept of making it a high performance business or having it financed by outside money and growing it a certain you know it wasn't that wasn't the ethos of the company so it was interesting because then when the company just sort of took off because it was you know it was timed right and it was cool and it was hip and we hit on some very interesting ways to bring the product to market all of a sudden the company started growing like it has a life of its own Mm -hmm. and then um, what happened was it got to a point where it was way beyond the um, imagination of what the founders had had envisioned. And the responsibilities of running a business like that were very, very complex. And um, we got to a point where we were doing about, I think we were doing about 50 million in sales. We had 750 employees. We were having a lot of problems in the company around performance. We had sort of a new group of managers who were advocating profit um, a whole group of people were saying, well, what, why, are, why, are we, why are we pursuing profit? We're about you know, making the world a better place. We're about saving the planet. There was one group of people saying, you know, no profit, no purpose. It was very interesting. And, and this group, you know, it was a very um, 
tense time. So the management team of which I was a member thought, let's go back to what the core values of the company are, what we stand for. Let's now enroll everyone in the company in the core values of the company. And this will sort of alleviate all the tension. Everybody will understand that we have to you know, make a profit to pursue our purpose and it'll work out. We'll alleviate this tension. So we went around, we d developed this very elaborate program called Living Vision. Uh, we, we met with every person in the company and we thought, okay, this is great. Everything will be healed. Right after that, we had the largest turnover in the, in the company's history. We had more people leave the company. I mean, we had about a third of the people in the company leave. It was devastating. And these were a lot of the people that were sort of there from the beginning. But in retrospect, it was very powerful what happened because as soon as the company finally articulated and expressed what its values were, not that it was sort of representative of this kind of cool lifestyle or about sustainability or where we really define what we meant by these things, what we meant, how much profit, how much environmental commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, you're always in a process in a business. You're always moving toward incremental improvement. And if you keep it really fuzzy, it's a recipe for disaster. So after we, after we clarified it, we had this big turnover. Then about a year later, we had this extraordinarily terrifying E. coli crisis. Right. Um, and I, I'm convinced that if we had not had that, that kind of clarifying event, that the company would not have performed in the, in the kind of sensationally admirable way that it did to get through that crisis. So in a way, the, the um, now, now that I've had that experience, I think we focus a lot of energy on how do you put these kind of design pieces into the structure of the business. And that's why I think World of Good is so interesting as a model, as a, as a prototype of a business that's really designed for you know, a specific um, outcome. You know, when you talk about design, I mean, one, I think one of the things probably everyone in the audience is interested in is, you know, how do you get the investors uh, to invest in a social venture, and what do those investors look like? Um, it would be great to hear about, you know, sort of who your investors are, what kind of returns they expect, and what kind of time frame, and what are the differences, you know, were you were you to not have your social mission? Um, how would that change the kind of investors who would have been looking at you? You want me to start? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the profile of our investors, I said one of them is a, an affiliate of the uh, Simon Property Group. Steve Simon sits on our board. Um, the rest of them are a combination of uh, really in between uh, the VC and angel um, prototypes. Um, another one of our board members and investors is uh, Tim Kugel, the former CEO uh, of Yahoo. Um, there are um, there's the Sumitomo Corporation of America. There is um, there are, there's another financial player called uh, LMS Capital, which is um, again a an entity that uh, manages the money of um, a, a group of real estate investors um, based out of the UK. Now, um, what's interesting about the profile of these investors is that um, each one of them, through the investments that they make, um, has been focused on um, two things, brands and uh, brands and companies that have a purpose. And so those were the types of people that we sought out um, in our investor group. Um, what they really get, um, more so than I think some, some other types of investors that we could have brought in, is that what is so special about our brand uh, and about our company is um, all of the dimensions that make it unique. Um, so in our space, um, it, those are the, the four di dimensions that differentiate our products, which are the design uh, or the aesthetic, uh, the environmental profile, its performance, it's a commodity product, it's got to work, and then, the, and then the fragrance. Those are kind of four things that we build into every product that we do. Um, and what's great about this investor group is they will not let us sacrifice on, on the standards that we have for each one of those. So for the environmental standards, we've got a whole set of standards of packaging, the formulation, you know, everything that goes into the product that uh, are minimum standards that um, that define an environmentally responsible product for us. We have the same thing in the design world, the same thing in the fragrance world, um, and they will not let us go below um, uh, um, those minimum standards. 
even for financial return. And I think that that's really important because in the process of bringing in a, a group of investors, we certainly ran across um, and, and had an opportunity to work with investor groups that were more uh, financially oriented or they were more uh, design oriented. So that they, they loved the design aspect of the method brand, um, but the other things weren't as important to it. And so it would have shifted the balance a little bit uh, in the advisory um, capacity that the board has. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that would have been for the worse for our business. So um, that's, that's kind of the profile of what they are. And I think that uh, I'm really grateful for the investors that we do have, that, that they're really pushing us to um, do our best in each one of these areas. It really is preserving what's special about not only our, our brand, but our company. Mm -hmm. so. Priya, you talked about how you're getting funding from a variety of different investors, including those who are simply looking at it as a business model. Um, has there been any tension on the board as a result of you know investors who are coming in with different kinds of motivations or? No, uh, not yet. Not yet. No. <laughs> so I feel like um, till now it's I mean, we're still pretty young. I mean, right? We yeah. closed our round like. I don't know, this year, so it's not very long. And, I mean, to some degree, this holiday season is kind of probably our first true test. I mean, we're, October was good, so there's, an, I mean, I, I think you find out where your stresses are during, if you have them, during the times of difficulty or when there's uh, disagreement on strategy. I will say that, like, just as in any, like, any early stage company, there's different moments of, like, prioritization, like, okay, you know, and I think in general, everyone on the board gets and actually chose to invest in the company because of both the mission behind the products and, and the business itself. So I don't think, I would say when I say they're purely business, it's that they look at the fact that the mission embedded inside of the business is a great business. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's that they're not interested in the mission. They see it as fundamental to the business. I mean, if you took World of Good and then tomorrow made all the products in a sweatshop in China. Right. It wouldn't be in its same channel strategy. It wouldn't have its same consumers. It couldn't have its same. I mean, it's not. It's so integrated that you can't pull it apart. You couldn't sell what we sell the way we sell it without it. So, right. I don't think. I think it's that they're interested in the business with that as part of it. So, I, I would also want to just dispel any um, expectation that anyone has that there's a social venture capital marketplace <coughs> out there. I think some. I, I've noticed. In the Bay Area, I go to different conferences or whatever, and people are talking about you know social venture capital, and it's a social and venture are a little oxymoronic because I mean particularly here in in the heart of Silicon Valley, venture capital has has meant you know extraordinary returns, big portfolios where most of them don't work, and one or two home runs, and that's what's worked traditionally in the technology sector. Um, there are some people you know out. Uh, raising capital and um, and making commitments that they're going to they're going to make market rate of return on the financial side and somehow generate some social value. Um, Bay Area Equity Partners, which is uh, uh, part of J.P. Morgan, Michael Dorsey was here, uh, and they're saying they go to their investors and they say we're going to you know get market rate of returns for venture capitalists and we're going to do it in a way that generates value in underserved communities. So they've what they've done is they've narrowed their geographic focus of where they'll invest and they take a look at sort of the job creation potential of a company. But we're still in a very kind of primitive stage of seeing organized capital coalesce around um, something that is indeed called a social venture. I'd also add that you know you could go to any venture capital or professional investor in the country or let alone the world and they will tell you that they're socially responsible. They will because nobody will intentionally or knowingly invest in something that's not. So again, this just points to the ambiguity or you know of the of the meaning of this word socially responsible or sustainable for that matter. It doesn't really mean a lot. It's kind of in the eyes or in the beholder. And this is where some of the danger is. And I think, again, just having had the privilege of kind of looking over Priya's shoulder a little bit when she was raising this capital was the need to kind of flesh out what people's expectations are in terms of the time frame for return, um, the scale of return, 
because people can talk about shared values across the table in a sort of a financial environment very, very easily until you get down to specifics. So if you're an entrepreneur, I would just really encourage you to go to the toughest questions first. And it's usually around this sort of rub of what are your expectations. You'll hear people say, "Oh, I love your, I love your um, sourcing standards, and you know, I love your commitment to these environmental packages. You know, and I'm expecting a 20%, you know, IRR on my money." So um, some of these things, you know, it's really stretching everybody. I would argue that you know, working with a business that's trying to do more than just make a profit is a lot harder. <laughs> At, at, at Haas, about, I don't remember, it was about five or six years ago, somebody wrote an editorial in the school paper and said, oh, all these students that are pursuing socially responsible business, they're just a bunch of tree huggers. Remember, it was sort of regarded as, as soft business. But I, I would argue that it's actually a lot harder doing this kind of realm of trying to prove yourself in the marketplace with really respectable financial returns and generate positive social value and you know put a put a flag in the the sand and track it and report it and get better at it um, is just a lot harder than business as usual so you know if there isn't sort of these sort of self-identified you know social venture investors where where should people go to find sort of seed money Maxing out your credit cards, hitting up parents, <coughs> friends, well, I think, family. I think that um, any, you know, n number one, I think you have to you have to look good and hard and see um, what capital you need. I think what what Priya said was very relevant. Raising capital is kind of a seductive thing. I mean, it's kind of glorified, particularly here in in Silicon Valley. It's like a badge of honor. But I, I like, you know, there, there's sort of several schools of thought. One is you want to kind of raise as little money as possible, right? Because you, you'd ideally like to um, own as much of your company as possible. And so you don't want to sell equity in your company too early. And you also want to make sure that your company can scale and really put the money to use. I mean, the money should really have a very specific use of proceeds, you know. Where is this money going to go and where is it going to take you? So knowing who to talk to at the right time becomes really uh, you know, important. And there is not that much uh, capital available for uh, non sort of IP protected companies. There's always sort of a dearth of, of uh, early stage capital. So most of it comes from non-traditional sources, and those non-traditional sources are relatives, friends, business school peers. I can't tell you how many people I've seen, you know, like yourselves, who have successfully raised the first round of capital from their business school buddies. And, um, you know, to Adam, both Adam and Priya did convertible debt. You know, this is sort of a very good way to go when you're first getting off the ground. You're saying to your parents, you know, loan me $25,000 and if I get this going and it looks like you know it's going to go, um, I'll pay you back someday. If it looks like it's really going to grow fast and could support the need for some expansion capital and we raise that capital, you can convert your um, investment into that at a very favorable uh, valuation. So, then you lose everybody's money. Yeah, and you've got some explaining to do over the Christmas dinner table. You do, and 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 it's true. And um, and I I've, I've been involved in ventures that have lost people's money, and it's very very difficult. It's very very difficult. It's something you have to take very seriously. Um, you know, you have a fiduciary responsibility, so you have to be. You know, you, you. I would I would just encourage you never raise money from somebody that can't afford to lose it all. Yeah. yeah. What, what we said, what, what we said to every person that gave us um, part of that initial uh, convertible debt was, "You're giving me this check, and you're losing this money forever. If you if you're not gonna look at it this way, then do not give us this check." Um, because I mean, that was as much stress as I've ever felt in the world was having all of my friends and family. I asked everybody, and every person I knew and cared about had was putting their bet on Adam and 
you know, getting up every morning with that motivation was, you know, that was a lot That's to handle. Tough, yeah. So. Um, before we open it up for general Q&A, just one last question. Um, you know, a lot of the students here may not immediately start their own venture right after school. They might go into consulting or a uh, large company or small company. Do you have any advice on what is kind of the ideal situation for them to get some experience and training that would best prepare them to start their own social venture? Well, I think... Um Finding a good mentor mm -hmm. is always, or mentors in life, is, is a great thing to seek out. Um, I think watching and learning from people what they do and what you, what they do that you don't want to emulate is are, are also good experiences. Um, I think that you know there comes a time when it's right in a person's life to really commit. But I think that uh, you have to be very patient and you also have to be very persistent at the same time. You have to be prepared to be turned down over and over and over again. You have to be prepared to be told by people that know a lot more than you do that you're crazy. Um, and you have to be humble uh, about taking that feedback, but you also have to be um, you know, very, very pragmatic about how you go about things. But if you want to really um, be effective, you have to be committed to the, the deeper purpose. You have to know why you why you want to do this mm -hmm. and why it's important for you to do it. So if you stay committed to the purpose and um, really test that commitment, I think th those are kind of the building blocks for success. If you keep yourself in that state of mind, no matter what you're doing, if you're working for someone else for a while or you're working with someone, um, if you keep those sort of tenants alive and you cultivate and nurture your ideas and then you find sort of um, similar minded people that share your passion um, and your purpose, um, so, you know, you never know when it can happen. And then if you go fly through Newark Airport, that's a that's very right. good um, <laughs> I guess, um, well, I, don't, I mean, I'm, I guess I've had the experience in my own life of that I've never been able to do anything else. That's really the truth. I mean, from the time I was in high school, that was my first startup, which I did with my dad to help start a free health clinic. I was an undergrad at Stanford. I started an organization in East Palo Alto that's a hybrid, also that does drug and alcohol treatment, affordable housing, economic development. And I was 21. I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't supposed to know how to do what I was doing. I, had, I started that organization with a whole group of people who were all really amazing community leaders, but also all recovering addicts and alcoholics who had been to prison and jail and whose own lives were inspiring to me. And I thought we should find a way to make that happen for everyone else in the community. And I was totally unqualified to do it and had no reason to believe I could do it. And I think in a lot of ways, starting World of Good, it's kind of the same. I mean, I have no background in retail, have no background in product design or development. I have no background. I mean, I have a deep compassion for what we're doing underneath everything, and I would be my consumer. And other than that, you know, everything else is like gut instinct and intuition about how to build a team, how to build a company, how to make it grow. And I think that um, I'm very lucky because the one thing I've always had in my life two things one is our great mentors or teachers and I'm like very willing because if you don't know anything the one thing you can figure out is who does and go find them and ask them and if you can do that with humility and openness and like you know it's very Indian I think the idea of being a disciple and having gurus like that's a very Indian notion that I grew up with since I was a kid and I think it's played out my whole life and um and I think from the time I was in high school, my dad was my first one. And then, you know, in East Palo Alto, I had others. And then now in World of Good, I have others. And, I mean, Will is one of them for me. So I think that I'm very fortunate. And, you know, on the other hand, I also think the other thing that I feel having been in business school is that, and I know the driving force inside of myself that, like, there is nothing else I could do right now. Like I couldn't be, like even if I was on vacation in the beaches, in the Bahamas, I would be doing this. I've been thinking about this. This is meant to manifest in me. It's like something, it's a force beyond my own will. And that's how I felt when I started Free at Last. And I know that feeling. It's just like something that has to come. And it's like, it's like being an artist. It's like something that just has to come out of you. 
and you just have to serve it, you know, when it comes. And that's a lot of times how I feel about what I'm doing. And I feel very grateful to be called by the world, the universe, whatever. I mean, I don't want to sound like all fruitcakey, but it's how it feels, you know. And so I guess, you know, and the other thing, I, but I do feel from having been in business school is that there's this kind of illusion around being an entrepreneur and a kind of like, I don't know, like kind of like putting people up on a pedestal for being one. And I just think it really sucks. Like, I don't really like it. I don't think it's really truthful. I think that most people who are great, quote unquote, entrepreneurs, which, you know, the best thing about them are really all the people that helped them and all the people that worked with them and all the people that chose to come along, you know. And I feel that way about my team. I feel that way about my mentors. So I guess the part I feel in business school that I wish would happen more is more of an emphasis on all the people who are the number two person, the number three person, the number ten person in the company. That's what really makes it happen. And so... Um, I don't know. I just hope that all of you realize that like picking someone of your classmates who has a great idea and following and working with them could be the best thing that you do and doesn't always have to be your own idea. And there's a lot of ego attachment to that, especially in our like American mm -hmm. business school like way of thinking. And I think um, anyway, whatever. I don't know. It's like kind of a soapbox, <laughs> but you get the point. <laughs> but I think it's important. So. Um, Go ahead, Adam. Oh, okay. So I think the, the question was more like kind of advice on how to get there if you're not going to start it right away. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't have that experience exactly, but I'll, I'll tell you what my experience was. Um, I, I'm kind of a bleeding heart, and uh, when I, and I studied environmental science uh, in undergrad, and so not long after undergrad, I found myself at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, which is a uh, foundation it's actually here on campus that starts uh, that studies um, climate change and I was working there and believed very deeply in the science that we were working on um, and this was back in the mid to late 90s and um, we were really on the on the forefront of environmental problems and proving that they were real and that something needed to be done about them um, and I got frustrated there that the work we were doing was incredibly meaningful, but um, the audience wasn't large. It was uh, we were we were writing. I was helping to write articles in journals that that had very obscure names that no one here probably has ever heard of or would ever read, um, and that was frustrating to me. So, um, and I also had done a couple of things where I was trying to kind of go big and make a quantum leap from the pro from a product design standpoint that didn't really go anywhere. And um, that was kind of my epiphany that I needed to kind of go do something um, on my own in order to really reach a broader audience. And it really is the reason why our brand today, and I keep going back to the brand, but that is, um, you know, our business really. Um, it's the reason why our brand um, is, uh, people often ask me, why is the method brand, for those of you who have seen it, um, why does it not overtly talk about the green story? Why does it have a green leaf on the package and um, you know really play that aspect up as the primary story? Um, and the reason for that for us is we're really trying to mainstream um, environmentally sensitive cleaning products and, and home care products and tie that back to the emotion of the home. And we really feel like by making that the lead story, that would that would really let us resonate with a certain consumer. Um, but that consumer's already served. There's a lot of great brands in that cat in the natural category already. Seventh generation planet. These guys do a great job. Um, but what we really want to do is we want to reach a broad audience, and that's why we go to places like Target. That's why right now we're we're going to Walmart. Um, that's why we're at grocery stores and club stores. Um, so, you know, for us it, or for me personally, it was it was a process of going to work directly on the things that I thought were you know, meaningful to me, um, and then it was a process of becoming frustrated with how much impact I can make uh, in that capacity that just kind of sent me like, I got to go do my own thing here because it's driving me nuts. Um, and I, I think that, that Priya's story is, is, is right on um, in terms of how we kind of built it a little bit. I think that as a founder, there. It, there is a mystique around being a founder of a business, and, and like you said, um, I'm finding more and more that um, you mentioned humility. That's incredibly important. Um, efforts, obviously, really important. But we've done exactly the same thing, where we go out and we didn't know anything about 
growing a business, raising capital, selling into grocery stores. These are things we had no clue about. And we went out and our philosophy was, hey, let's, let's find the people that know how to do this, put them in place, give them incentive to do really well, and then just get the hell out of the way and like make sure that the vision is right so that you know, that, that we're thinking about environmental responsibility and everything that we do. We're thinking about how to grow this brand um, and let those people